I'm a bit of a brain nerd these days because I've been learning so much about the neuroscience that is coming out, all these results are coming out day, day upon day, really, um, teaching us more and more about how the brain works and how important it is for us to know how the brain works, to really understand how to shape interventions, education, healing, um, and I want to share that neuroscience with everyone because when I learned the neuroscience, it started explaining a whole lot to me about my own personal life, my own personal struggles, and why I was bumping up against walls in my life as a woman, and also why that was happening to me as a practitioner. And getting those answers started to free me up to greater possibility for how I could be useful as a parent, as a, a partner, as uh, a teacher, and as a healer. So, the neuroscience. What we now know is that there is a single capacity that when we possess it to its fullest degree, it makes everything in life possible. Learning makes learning possible. It makes adaptive pro-social behavior possible. It actually moves us out of an I can't place, you know, this is what it looks like and feels like, to an I can do anything place. And that single capacity is called self-regulation. Self-regulation is our ability to modulate or tolerate our arousal levels. And arousal can have to do with just a physiological experience of excitement, nerves, um, and it can also be related to affect, anger, and frustration, and, you know, but this, the, the idea is that our arousal can get very big and high and powerful, and when it does, it can sweep us away. If we can keep it within a manageable range, which is what self-regulation helps us to do. If we can keep it in a manageable range, or what many people call either the zone of optimum arousal, or what others call the window of tolerance. If we can keep arousal within that degree so that it's not either too high or too low, we can tolerate, you know, the, the, the stress of life, the trauma that can get thrown at us, the, our daily struggles aren't overwhelming to us when we have this ability to modulate, right? Keep the arousal in an optimum zone. So it's important for us to understand how self-regulation develops, how it is um, affected by the stress and or trauma struggles of our daily life. So how does it develop? And then how is it affected by our experiences, right? Because things can go wrong. It, it, Self-regulation can go awry. It, it really can, um, we can become deregulated, if you want to use that term, or unregulated, and that's when we can really run into a lot of trouble. It, it keeps us from healing in the fullest way. Um, and so, how does self-regulation develop? This is very exciting, and actually, it's, it's interesting and it relates to, um, to various textbooks that exist right now on the development of the brain that are not even very old, five to ten years old, and yet the information is outdated. I've come across several of these textbooks. <clears throat> we think that in the first, uh, we've thought, and some still continue to believe, that after the first trimester of pregnancy, that we have our um, oldest uh, part of our brain, the animal brain, fully developed in the first trimester. Then we have a second part of our brain, the emotional brain, called the limbic brain. And it was once believed that this part of the brain was fully developed at the end of the second trimester, which makes sense, right? First trimester, we have the first most primitive part of our brain. Second trimester, we have, oh, now we have our emotional brain. At the end of the third trimester, 
we once thought that we had our third and final part of our brain, which is called the neocortex. It's the part of us that makes us fully human, rational, reasonable, thoughtful, insightful, right? We've got all the answers when we have our neocortex, right? And it was once believed that we had that third part developed at the end of the third trimester so that when we're born as a little baby, we're born with a fully functioning brain ready to go and take us through life. Not at all true. Um, not even close. In fact, at birth, all we have is that most primitive part of our brain called, some call it the animal brain. It's, it's, I keep doing this because it's actually um, at the base of the skull and it connects with the spinal cord. So it's very deep and it's very hardwired, um, which is why it's called this animal brain. It's the oldest part of our brain. In fact, we share it with every living creature on earth. There are parts of prehistoric fish that have this part of the brain. So it's very old, it's very hardwired, and what it's hardwired for is our survival. So it's all about our arousal. So when I talk about self-regulation, being the, the ability to modulate arousal, the development of that starts from the very beginning of conception with the onset of the development of this animal brain. It's also called the reptilian brain or the brain stem. <clears throat> it speaks a very particular kind of language. It's the language of sensations. That part of the brain um, does not understand words. That's the neocortex up here that comes on much later. This brain that we're born with, and that's all we're born with, the only exceptions is a small little piece of the visual cortex and a small little piece of the auditory cortex. Other than that, we have our animal brain and its function of arousal, okay? So we're born and all little babies experience um, is uh, one of two different states. Distress, change my diaper, right? Or contentment, thank you for changing my diaper, right? Or oh, I'm hungry, feed me now, distress, right? Or oh, contentment, thank you for feeding me. That was yummy, right? That's what babies experience, these two levels of arousal. That's what the animal brain modulates. Arousal and the coming down of that arousal, right? So the newborn baby with only its animal brain that modulates, that cares only about survival and modulates this process of arousal, right? And speaks only the language of sensations so let's really think about that, right? A newborn baby, how do you communicate with a newborn baby? It's only through our senses. If they can't smell it, taste it, feel it, hear it, right? It's not, it means nothing to them other than that. So you can speak your words all day long, right? But do babies understand our words? They don't understand our words. If you wanna communicate with a baby, you have to do it through the five senses. It has to be the cooing and the shushing and the rocking and the soft blanket and the suckling and everything is sensory. Your smell is so important to a baby, right? Your sound. So they don't care about the words that you're speaking, but do they care about the tone of your voice? Do they care about your facial expressions, right? Is it contorted like, oh, if this baby wakes up one more time, right? Or is it, ah, oh, it's so good to be with that, that is affecting the arousal level of that baby. So are we causing the distress or are we causing the contentment? You see, how, how we do that, whether we take them to this really highly aroused place and keep them there, is gonna determine how that ability to self-regulate starts to, to come on board. Right? So if we're responding to our baby with sensations in a really responsive way, in a timely fashion, and we're soothing our baby, right, with sensations, sensory experiences, then self-regulation starts to come on board in a really yummy way, right? It feels yummy. It's, it's good. It's I'm distressed, but now I'm content. You know, I'm not left in distress, right? but I'm soothed back into 
um, a comfortable state. That's what self-regulation is all about. It allows the comfortable state.